There is a bell that rings at 11 o'clock and every hour in Philadelphia around 9th and Christian. And I hear it and I've been trying to capture this bell for 20 years. And about three months ago, I finally grabbed it by the neck and I pinned it down and I wrote this. After the bell, within the silence, within myself. After the bell, within the silence, within myself. It's a meditative poem. What it's saying, what's it saying? The bell is supposedly outside of you, but no, it's really happening inside of you. After the bell, within the silence, within myself. Nick Virgilio, who many critics considered the greatest writer of haiku poetry in the English language, died this week at the age of 60. Nick Virgilio was a commentator for this program when it first went on the air in 1985. Scott Simon, the host of Weekend Edition, is off this week, but sends this remembrance. Nick Virgilio was a short, blunt, bald-headed man who sat beneath a hot light bulb in the basement of his home in Camden, New Jersey, and rung poetry out of a battered black upright typewriter. Nick, I once told him, you ought to try writing on a word processor. You can change the words around all you want. And Nick said, nah, I don't think so. Words shouldn't be so easy to change. Nick was a grown man who lived at home to care for his invalid mother, a poet whose work was mostly unknown among his neighbors in Camden, New Jersey, but avidly read in Japan. Every few weeks, when he was one of our commentators, we felt we had to remind our listeners that haiku is a poetic form of 17 syllables invented by the Japanese, a definition Nick would expand. A haiku is a record of a moment of emotion keenly perceived that somehow links human nature to all nature. His best-known poem, once said to be particularly cherished by the Crown Prince of Japan, went, Lily, out of the water, out of itself. Well, Nick Virgilio was born in Camden in, in 1928 and lived his entire life in Camden, except for a short period in the Navy and a short period in Texas. And um, he went to uh, grammar school and high school in Camden. and. Um, he, um, he set out to be a, a radio announcer and started off in uh, Wildwood uh, covering basketball games. I believe at that time Nick uh, went for a job in Texas and while he was in Texas it apparently uh, he fell in love and uh, to the extent that he actually wrote some songs about it, kind of broken hearted songs. And uh, when that didn't work out and his contract was up, he came back to Camden and moved into his, his home uh, where his parents lived and uh, began to uh, study haiku through reading a book he, ran, he found in the Rutgers Library in Camden. He was one of these persistent guys who, who wanted to learn about this. And of course, and people, uh, when he used to uh, recite his, his poems to him, they, they gave him encouragement, which was very important in him in continuing to, uh, to, to learn more and more about the haiku. At some point around that time, he hooked up with Jerry Blavitt, uh, who had a radio show in Philadelphia, and became his sidekick, so he would do Jerry's introductions. And I gave him a name called Nicophonic Nick, and I created a persona for him. Nicophonic Nick with the boss with the hot sauce, the gator with the heater, the man with the plan. And what I would have him do is intro my show. And he would intro the show. This is Nicophonic Nick, sidekick to the geat with the heat, the boss with the hot sauce, and here's the geeter with the heater. And I'd say, my man, Nicophonic Nick, without even knowing a name, this is the man that's going to play the game with the geeter with the heater. And that's how it really began. And when I would say, ladies and gentlemen, my man, Nicophonic Nick. 
and he'd go off. And then before we would go out to commercial, like I go out to commercial, okay, we'll be right back. I would say, Nickaphonic Nick, what do you have to say? Don't move that dial. The Gator will be back with a smile. So he would create some of these little vignettes. Nick, uh, you know, just kept on writing and writing, and he would he would send uh, his uh, his uh, finished poems to these different uh, magazines, uh, Cicada and, and uh, Frog Pond and the Modern Haiku. He found his niche, as simple as that. And he wasn't, and and, and he was going to perfect it. And uh, and I think he did. Lone red-winged blackbird riding a reed in high tide, billowing clouds. The blind musician extending an old tin cup collects a snowflake. Heat before the storm, a fly disturbs the quiet of the empty store. The sack of kittens sinking in the icy creek increases the cold. From the very beginning, he was pushing the boundaries, you know? So his first published haiku, spring wind freeze the full moon tangled in leafless trees, was rhymed. And that was a no-no, right? Two of his next published haiku were Lily Out of the Water Out of Itself, which was nowhere near 17 syllables, and um, Bass Picking Bugs Off the Moon. You know, there are a lot of poems about reflections, but Bass Picking Bugs Off the Moon, right? I mean, there's surprise in that. You could hear that poem and go, you'd have to think about it a little bit, Bass Picking Bugs Off the Moon. Oh, I get it. So, you, so he doesn't tell you what the scene is, right? You just get that central image and then you have to fill in the, um, the rest. I work in the schools and sometimes I get the kids, you know, to write haiku. And, uh, and I'll do nicks to get them, you know, into the haiku frame of mind. And I'll do bass picking bugs off the moon. Oh, how can a bass pick bugs off the moon? Oh, they go up to the moon in a rocket ship and pick bugs. You know, and then finally, finally, one kid will say, Oh, it's the reflection in the water. The moon in the water. Yes, yes, you know, in just that moment, everybody goes, Oh, the moon in the water. Joy, you know, you're going to get your sorrow, but you got to get your joy, you know. <laughs> the Whitman says to cast out those ductile anchors that catch you on somewhere in my soul, you know. This is what we all want to do. We want to share our lives. We want to make a connection with other people, with life, you know, because we're so damn lonely. We're so alone and cut off. So we do these things, we get our act together, and we present it. We hope people like it. You know what I mean? Nick Virgilio is one of my favorite poets. I think he's one of the great American poets of all time. I met Nick way back in, I can't even remember now, whether it was the 60s or 70s. Uh, put him in my first uh, anthology, the Haiku Anthology, the first edition in 1974. And I've had him in every edition since. There was something about his haiku that it had a, a depth to it. It had a, like, almost like a cutting edge that was clean and, and incisive like the way he wrote. And there was nothing fluffy about Nick Virgilio's haiku. It was always keen, incisive, clear, focused. It was always like that. The sack of kittens sinking in the icy creek increases the cold. The sack of kittens sinking in the icy creek increases the cold. Critics the po people who, you know, write about poetry and analyze and so forth. They talked about how much was going on in that poem, the, the warmth of life to the cold 
of death. The K sounds, the, the K, the cracking, the sack of kittens sinking in the icy creek increases the cold. All those, all that sound of K, 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 which is a sound of just almost the terror of, of, of the, the live kittens dying, going from you know, life to death, from warmth to cold, from one state of being to another. Um, that wasn't something that came right out of Nick. I mean, he worked on that. And when that came about, that was a masterpiece. Nick uh, wrote about things that um, a lot of people didn't write about, I think. And a lot of haiku is kind of like very la-di-da, natural, kind of cool in the fact that it's so concise and brings a picture, but Nick's pictures aren't always pretty. The whole series that Nick wrote about his uh, younger brother Larry, who died in the Vietnam War, it, it, it just a, a wonderful uh, collection of poems in the elegiac mode to, to show how love can preserve the memory and, and the importance of those, those people that are close to us. Uh, one of the ones that impressed me the most is uh, a very simple image. It's 16th autumn since, barely visible grease marks where he parked his car. Nick would notice s simple things like that, where his brother had parked his car when he was a young man uh, before he went off to war. And 16 years after he died in Vietnam, Nick still uh, remembers his brother when he sees these little grease marks where he had parked his car. It's a, to me, that's one of the most wonderful poems in memory of a loved one that's ever been written in the English language. Before Larry uh, was going off to, to boot uh, training, he, he was in the square with his buddies and he, he shimmied up this enormous flagpole and he, and he, uh, and he took a, a piece of chewing gum and a dime and he stuck it on the top and he said, when I come back, I'm going to go up and get that dime. Can you make a living writing haiku? <laughs> no, I cannot. I do make uh, uh, readings, and I get paid as high as five hundred dollars. You know, that's a rarity. But and I do children's workshops. You uh -huh. know, I don't have an automobile. I use uh, uh, dead man's clothes and so forth. You know what I mean? Like that's how I get by. I'm uh, d d dead man's clothes are, are clothes that belong to somebody who's no longer yeah. among the living. Yeah, that's right. That's what I mean. I mean saying that I that I have some nice looking clothes, but they were given to me. You know by various and sundry people some people some clothes I bought myself I mean I get that's how I get by you know yeah. I I cut corners and uh, in order so that I can spend time writing you know well Nick was a short man but but he had a long shadow and uh, he cast it everywhere Nick uh, just kept on pushing forward uh, uh, he had uh, a couple of successes, but he had many, many more rejections, but it, it didn't seem to, to falter him in any way. He just kept on uh, pushing forward, and of course, the people from the Sacred Heart uh, Church and all, they, they encouraged him, even though he was, he, in a sense, he was a pest. He was the typical 
you know, get your toe in the door. Forget the foot. If he got his toe in the door, he'd wiggle it to get the second toe in. I mean, he could, he definitely, not in what I ever perceived as an annoying way, but in a way that he, he truly had this, this uh, gift and, and ability to endear himself to people, even though some people would call him a nudge. When I first met him in the foyer of Sacred Heart Church, he was doing a headstand. And as I walked around him, incredulously, I must say, I said hi and walked into the church. And before I got two or three steps in there, he'd uh, come up behind me and grab me and read me a haiku. And then he'd say, what do you think? And then before he could answer, he would say, needs work, doesn't it? Nick used to call me up around 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, because he would be so excited about one of his new haiku, he was like, I want you to hear this, I want to get your reaction. Rocky, what do you think of this poem? And then he'd give me a poem, and, and then, uh, what do you think of this one? And always, there would always be one that you really liked, because he was such a good poet, so you didn't have to lie and say, oh, they were both great, Nick. What's the last line? That was a great one of his. He'd say, he'd, you'd read the first two lines, he'd hide it, he'd say, what's the last line? And a lot of times you'd say, you know, you'd think that the poem was going in a certain direction, went in an entirely different, but you loved it. He was into fresh garlic, garlic pills. Um, I mean, he, he literally, um, you couldn't get close to him when he was on a garlic kick because he, he reeked of it. Um, um, and I, the carrot juice, I, you know, it's just, you know, he would go, it was typical of Nick that he never did anything uh, moder in moderation. So when he was into carrot juice, he was, he was drinking gallons of it, and you could actually, I mean, literally, his skin would get orange. When he got into juicing, he told me about the carrots, like at the, the restaurant, at the diner, we would get these carrots, they'd be that long and, and that thick, and he said they were the ones that, you know, he really wanted to buy, not the little skinny things at the supermarket. So carrots came in a 50-pound bag, you know, usually uh, wrapped in a plastic bag, very tightly wrapped, and he started ordering about once a week a 50 pounder of carrots. He would wake up six, five, six o'clock in the morning and he'd take this walk and he wouldn't come back. And he'd, he'd come in, maybe get something to eat, a cup of chamomile tea or something, and then he would come right down here and spend eight, eight, eight hours down here trying to, you know, hone his haiku. And that's. Uh, uh, that was amazing to see to, to see a guy so uh, so devoted. He would go to the writing terminal uh, in the morning on the bus, and he would call ahead of time, see do we need any fish or something from the writing terminal, and he would he would come back here about one o'clock, and if he with some food, we'd come in here, he would put the fish away in the refrigerator. He would turn to the sink over there, and he, any dishes in it, he would wash them. And I was fascinated by the fact that I had a, an internationally known haiku poet washing dishes for me and chatting with me. And he would do that, he would make tea, and then he would hit me with two new haiku to see that I liked them. I think he had a public persona that was you know, kind of all hustle and, you know, I mean, I used to say he had the personality of a used car salesman. I mean, just talk, talk, talk. And Father Doyle, on the other hand, said it came from being on the radio where you, you couldn't have much silence, right? So he filled the, the air. Um, but the other side of him was this deeply contemplative, um, you know, getting up at five o'clock in the morning, doing his yoga. He had a routine. It was very monastic. You know, he would go out and walk along Newton Creek and then show up at the diner at, you know, nine. I mean, I compare it to his, you know, Nick's liturgy of the hours, if you will. He had a routine that really generated his creative process, and God knows how many hours he spent under the bare light bulb in the basement. I just write, you know. I mean, I write because I have to write. I was turned on by the Lily Poem. People said, man, you're good, you got talent, you know. And it, and it becomes, becomes like a disease after a while. You just keep writing and you become good at it. And so you, are. you, you build a better mousetrap and people better be a path to your door. You know, so, like, but we all, you know, so what's it all mean, really? You know, what can you be? A tight little package of humanity. You, know? you, can, 
you explore this provincial you and to become the universal, you know. And that's all. And then if you become, if you do become this tight little package of humanity, then you have something to offer. You know, you really have something to offer yourself. And that's all you have to offer anyway. And I try to do that through, through, my, through my work. What we're going to do today, um, as is our tradition, is we will share some memories of Nick, those of us who've been touched by him in one way or another, and we will share some haiku, some of Nick's and some of our own. Every year since 89, on the Sunday nearest his birthday, we gather at Nick's tomb and people are, are writing haiku and he's remembered and he has stimulated in people that, that wonderful interest in haiku which, as Kathleen uh, O'Toole says, calls us to notice. In, in, in the midst of all the traffic of life, that we might notice a uh, daisy, we might notice a, a cobweb on a tree. So Nick gave us that, so his, I, I'm sort of so, amazed at the fact that he, with his simple life, and that, that he, he now is calling us to, by his inspiration, to be reflective and thoughtful and to, you know, to see the sunset. My spring love affair, the old upright Remington, wears a new ribbon. Lost hair returning taking shape upon my head, Ming the Merciless. Well, I think his way of, of, of approaching life, uh, saying, you know, take that little piece of life and, and, and don't just remember it today, put it down on paper and, and, and make it something special. And uh, a lot of us have, have sort of done that in one way or another, maybe not always in, in a, writing a haiku, but, but basically saying that was a very important Thing that I noticed even though it was just a fleeting something. It was sort of out of the corner of my eye, but I caught it. Clusters of gold amid drying leaves, last color to leave the forest. Clusters of gold amid drying leaves, last color to leave the forest. I began corresponding with Nick Virgilio in, in 1971 when I was still a very young poet and uh, just starting a serious study of haiku and one of the most important things that Nick taught me way back then was his hard work ethic in regard to haiku composition uh, that this seemingly simple little poem uh, was not so simple to write an old elephant flanked by two younger. They can walk miles that way. Nick was a great publicist for haiku, and I really believe that if he had lived longer, uh, haiku would be uh, much better known around uh, the whole United States now than it is, because he was such a, a great spokesman for haiku. There was no one like him and uh, we miss him very much. Riding waves and oceans on oceans of experience coming out wet. Riding waves on oceans of experience coming out wet. He was a poet who didn't seem to be too pretentious and he made a lot of room for others to write. And uh, he had a lot of faith in children's ability to express themselves and to observe nature and it's uh, or observe their surroundings and express their, their observations uh, in, a, in a concise way. He wanted to spread the, the vision of what haiku is or could be. And, um, and he wanted to be remembered. He really wanted to be remembered. How many hearts you touched and how many lives you changed how many people picked up a pencil and wrote a haiku because of you. And they can say they wrote a poem. 
and how many people have a poem on their on their tomb like Lily out of the water out of itself Nick you rose out of yourself you lifted us all up out of our whatever life and made us a little better and that's all anybody could ask and we thank you we've all had these haiku experiences and you should all try to put them down in the least least number of words possible realizing that you're sharing this with someone else that you should set it up so that they can see a picture in other words what you would do is give them the big scene first and then the little the parts of the big scene so that they can see an immediate word painting mm -hmm. so I think it's very important that all of us become more conscious of, of our feelings and to share these with other people Is there one word in the English language you've ever wanted to use in a haiku you've never been able to work in? <laughs> I'll say that this is, the, this is the, the word that nobody can work in. Orange, I think. I never used the word orange. 